just give me a sign whether you hear, you see. Does it work? Okay. <laughs> so I'm Laura Ligazzolo, you pronounce it perfectly. And I work for the Council of Europe <laughs> on, a, on a program with the European Union. And the project is called Roots for You, Fostering Regional Development Through Transnational Cultural Roots, Heritage Policies and Practices in the four EU macro regions. So I'm neither an archaeologist uh, nor <laughs> an excavator <laughs> nor a professor, unfortunately. I come actually from the domain of human rights and international relations. But I think it's always uh, useful to try to step uh, each of us uh, a bit outside of our shoes, uh, our field of uh, expertise and uh, exchanging experiences to learn. So I think uh, this, uh, uh, this initiative you have today is very beneficial. So thank you. Um, this is not the time. People don't want to hear about it. Uh, we should not give the wrong message. I don't know whether you, but I did hear this type of concern very often in the last weeks concerning talking about tourism, talking about cultural tourism, cultural heritage, in view, of course, of the, of the pandemic and of the, the COVID confinement. And I do think that it's the time too, because uh, uh, tourism and hence also cultural heritage is one of the most affected sectors at the time. And there's a, uh, yes, uh, said at the very beginning, we have to think uh, uh, in a way to, 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 to shift uh, and in a strategic view for the recovery after for a different type of tourism. That uh, thinking about what will be possible and also what people will look for, because uh, there will be a trend, yes, in uh, local tourism more and uh, uh, less attractive destination, not crowded, uh, <laughs> crowded places. So I think it's very important that we keep on discussing this with this in mind. Um, so just a bit of the outline of the, um, the different steps I will try to go through in this uh, half an hour. So I will start uh, from interreg and cultural roots. As I told you, I don't come from uh, an interreg project either. Are there interlinks? Yes, no, if yes, which are they? Why does it make sense that we have this dialogue? Then a second step, it's about the cultural roots of the Council of Europe program, indeed. And the third point about Roots for You, so the very cooperation project uh, I'm working on, and a fourth final step about uh, specific experiences, tourism good practices, uh, to, to share about, okay, how do we put uh, into, into practice uh, this uh, overview, this understanding of heritage and uh, uh, transnational tourism. So, uh, starting from the first point, uh, interreg cultural roots. We do have many points in common because we both, first of all, are cooperation projects. We start from stakeholders, partners, who do share an, an objective and an interest in starting a joint venture. So this is what brings us together first. And then, of course, the rationale, which is behind, meaning on one hand, tackling common challenges, starting from some sort of weaknesses and points to address in the sense of <laughs> improving. And on the other hand, also recognizing which are the common resources, which are the common benefits that we have to make uh, the most out of it through cooperation. So trying to increase efficiency uh, from that point of view. Another point that we have in common, the regional framework. You are an inter working on an interreg in the South Baltic, that's a regional dimension. Cultural roots, and yes, I'm always referring to cultural roots of the Council of Europe, are not necessarily regional in nature because they um, they grow as European first, as a scope. But uh, there is a specific category of cultural roots which is territorial. And it's really a type of category which uh, um, is based on cultural roots which are shared by a given territory. Just to give you an example, we have uh, the uh, Roman emperors and Danube wine route. Uh, the name is very evident that it's a route along a given territory along the Danube. So this is uh, an example. And then uh, also we are working on some um, field of actions which are in common. So uh, heritage, cultural heritage and tourism are uh, on in the spotlight. And uh, I appreciate it very much reading through the, the description of the aims of this, uh, this webinar and also reading some, some documents about Archaeobalt that the objective 
um, goes beyond the touristic promotion and touristic development. I read uh, that it's about also developing a sense of joint social responsibility for the Baltic heritage. So um, this idea of raising awareness and creating a sense of ownership about heritage is very much important and paramount for projects we are working on different ways but with common uh, trends. And on this, I would like to quote uh, the European Cultural Convention, which is one of the earliest convention that was adop adopted by the Council of Europe. We date back to 1954. The organization was established in 1949. So for you to understand, we are at the very beginning of that uh, organization. And uh, it was very clear for, from the beginning that in the aftermath of the World War, with the objective of, again, bringing together the states in a cooperation uh, structure, cultural heritage should have been uh, considered as a resource to, to start from. And indeed, the convention states that uh, one of the objectives is to improve the collective awareness of Europe's cultural sites and their incorporation into the leisure culture. So uh, even the perspective of uh, making this a tool for development was evidently clear. And the fact of protecting heritage uh, and promoting it uh, is not uh, excluding the fact of also developing it as a resource and making also profit out of it. Another key point is that uh, many interreg deal with the idea of cultural roots. Uh, if I understood correctly, also Archeobalt aims at developing uh, roots, but also cultural roots of the Council of Europe, which were certified, developed then interreg project. I give you some concrete example, Atrium, is the um, cultural route of the Council of Europe dedicated to totalitarian architecture of the 20th century. Actually, they started as an interreg in 2011, 2013. In the 2014, they obtained the certification of the Council of Europe, and then they develop an interreg again. So <laughs> one thing is not excluding the, the other. Another example, the Hansa, is one of the strongest cultural routes in the Baltic Sea region because it's dedicated to the Hanseatic network of medieval time. And it means that still keeping this network alive of 185 cities around. Uh, they develop an interreg, which, are, which is called Exploranza, and they are at the same time cultural route. A very similar example with the Vikings route, again, another one, a very emblematic cultural route in the Baltic Sea region. Um, and this year, for instance, uh, um, we are working with uh, an interreg project that came to an end. It's called the Iron Age in the Danube, and they will apply uh, for certification, and we help them in this, uh, in this process. So I mentioned several times cultural roots of the Council of Europe. I kept repeating it. What am I talking about? So this is a program of the Council of Europe that dates back to 1987. A cultural route is defined, as you can see on the screen, as a cultural, educational, heritage and tourism cooperation project aiming at the development and promotion of an itinerary or a series of itinerary based on an historic route, a cultural concept, figure or phenomenon with a transnational importance and significance for the understanding and respect of common European values. So, 1987, we are at the time at which Europe was still divided again. <laughs> we are uh, still in the Cold War period. And it was understood, okay, we need to start again from culture. That's a way of bringing citizens together and make them understand what links them. So this was very evident. Um, the objective to um, promote the richness of the diversity and, and also to render shared European values into something tangible. Um, and uh, uh, looking at the, the definition, we can find some, some key elements which uh, um, describe a project of a cultural route. So again, the cooperation element, uh, the objective of development of these uh, uh, itineraries, paths, and uh, the heritage element on which they are based, um, which, yes, it's maybe an historical phenomenon, a given artistic movement, uh, a key uh, historical um, person, and this should have, uh, yes, a European-wide scope in terms of values, but also in terms of, for instance, an artistic movement like uh, um, Art Nouveau, the Liberty style, 
had a different interpretation in different countries. So today we have uh, 38 cultural routes of the Council of Europe uh, in Europe. And this map you see there, it's uh, the countries of the enlarged partial agreement. So it's uh, an agreement among states who do agree to support financially and politically this project. You see it's really Europe-wide, from Norway to Russia, even Turkey is part of it, Portugal. Uh, concerning the topics and the themes, and there are very strict criteria for obtaining this certification. And the certification and evaluation process, which take place every three years for the certified culture routes, it's a way somehow to keep on with given standards. You see here the main uh, teams and the field of action that are requested to be worked on. So have a topic which is representative of European values. So to see beyond the, the local heritage, the local identity, which is the European sense. Of this can we find links with other uh, countries then the cooperation aspect in research and development and this is key because uh, when it comes to heritage interpretation is always uh, an issue so it's important to have a scientific committee made of experts like you academics who can provide a sound understanding and interpretation of this heritage because apart from the how to say the content of the message the way it is uh, conveyed and uh, disseminated it's it needs to be sound on uh, research. The objective of enhancement of memory, heritage and uh, European history. Then one point on which I understood you're working very much, uh, the cultural and educational exchanges for young Europeans. So the focus uh, on the educational aspect of heritage, it's not only knowledge for the sake of knowledge, which is definitely worth in itself, <laughs> definitely, but it has also purpose that goes beyond and it's about educating. Um, and then uh, the work with uh, in cooperation, uh, cultural artistic practices. Uh, I saw many of your examples with like festivals, it's a way of disseminating and uh, reaching out, communicating, and the development of cultural tourism um, and sustainable cultural tourism uh, development. What um, uh, is somehow cross-cutting uh, these uh, areas, and I refer to, to, to our resolution, that is the basis of the certification, is the objective to promote dialogue between urban and rural cultures, between regions in the south, north, east and west, and develop and disadvantage regions. This is particularly relevant for all regions, but also for the Baltic, where uh, tourism is uh, concentrated in given spots, and there are uh, rural areas areas which are out of uh, the, the normal reach of touristic uh, trends. Another, another point is uh, the, the key aspect of seeking partnership with public and private organizations. Several of you pointed to this uh, as a key uh, strategy in order to develop touristic products and target different potential groups with an idea of diversifying the offer in order to respond to a diversified demand and with the idea of developing a quality tourism. Is it all okay? Can you hear me still? Yes, okay. <laughs> um, so these are the, um, the criteria concerning the team and then we have the criteria concerning the, the network. So the fact that uh, a structure needs to be legally established, this is to ensure the sustainability of the cooperation that is not a spot and that and uh, is not uh, brought forth, and that uh, the organization has to be democratic in the way it works. If we are talking about transnational routes, routes which are crossing different countries, at least three, this is the minimum standard, then this must be represented also in the structure which organizes and takes decision about this transnational network. What do we do in specific with Routes for You joint program? So this is my, my third point. You see this map, this is the map of the uh, European Union macro regions. You see in blue, it's the Baltic one. And actually this was the very first strategy which was um, adopted in 2009. Then we have in green the Danube region. It was adopted in 2010, the Adriatic and Ionian region 2014 and the Alpine region in 2015. What's the idea behind these strategies? There are three, no. 
<laughs> the basis. It might seem absurd, but it makes sense. So no uh, new funding in the sense that the strategies do not come with funding. For instance, Interreg, it's a funding under the territorial cooperation and the strategies are not meant at duplicated funding. No new institution. The idea is to bring together existing um, institution and foster a more um, uh, efficient cooperation and no new legislation. Again, it's the idea of not creating new, but bringing together what's already existing. The strategies indeed are defined as a policy framework. Uh, the countries which are part of them do identify their own objectives, topics of interest, priorities to tackle and set an action plan to do so. For the Baltic Sea region, the objectives are saving the sea, because of course the sea is the unifying element of the Baltic Sea region. <laughs> That's the, 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 what you have all in common for sure. Then of course, connecting the region and a third point about increasing prosperity. And under the policy area of increasing prosperity, there is also the attention to culture and, and the tourism. You see, we work with the macro regions and with the cultural roots. We try to bring together these two uh, perspectives. Again, the idea of tackling common challenges and making uh, the most out of common resources. Some examples of activities, very practical. Any learning. So we developed a free accessible online course with five modules with uh, different uh, resources, uh, assessments, uh, additional literature and possibility to delve into the issues. We developed this in cooperation with academic uh, experts. What are the topics assessed? I tell to you because I think it's cross-cutting several of your activities. Uh, so the first, uh, okay, it's about the cultural roots uh, of the Council of Europe, the certification for those who are interested in engaging in this process. The second one is about cultural tourism in remote areas. So how to increase the attractiveness of remote destination, rural areas, and how to bring to this, that uh, um, link between rural and urban areas, most uh, advantage and most disadvantage. So this is the second topic. The third one is about uh, social inclusion, community participation. So very much related to what uh, uh, Matthew was uh, referring to. And then we have a uh, module number four, which is about the cooperation with SMEs. So how to make the most out of a cooperation with activities, economic activities, which are at the grassroots level, where the sites are located, where the heritage is, where the community is. And then a fifth module about very much communication, marketing, how to uh, make sure to get the message through and reach out to, to the audience. And so these are the five modules. Three are already online. If then we have time, I can, can show you how they look like. Two will be online and there are also manuals that we are preparing. So um, to give the same content in a publication-like format, which can, be, which can be used. Another activity which serve the purpose of increasing the, the knowledge and the attractiveness of destination, we develop a digital platform, a trip planner, so a tool to develop, uh, to plan your own trip. It works, uh, as you see with this uh, image uh, on, on the left, uh, with, by filters. So of course, uh, it's possible to filter by the, the topic we are interested in, gastronomy, archaeology, architecture, art. We can decide uh, the region and we can decide uh, the cultural route. Then the, the system is like a search en engine and it, uh, of course, uh, selects the filters, we, the, 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 the sites and destination which do correspond to your filters. And it provides, of course, always the geolocation info, uh, a short description about that site, complemented by um, images, and also uh, information on like uh, opening times. If we are talking about a museum, uh, we need to know when <laughs> it's open. And it's related to Interrail, to see whether there are possibilities for you to move with using the train from one destination to the other. Indeed, you can save your own destination, change the order among them, and see how move, how much time, how much kilometers are there in between this, this destination. 
So this is an example. Um, then we do several other activities. We have uh, several studies undergoing about the economic impact of cultural roots, about uh, the policies on cultural roots, always with a regional perspective. And uh, yes, for instance, one of these uh, studies is a manual on signposting. When it comes to transnational cultural roots, uh, uh, it's one of the issues to have uh, panels signals which are recognizable as part of one route which crosses border. So to have something that corresponds on one hand and is consistent with the local rules and regulation about uh, how to signal sites, how to signal, signal direction, and on the other hand, to make it evident that it's part of a broader network. So now let's come to the last point. I hope I'm on time, I think so. Uh, with some more concrete, uh, um, specific example of good practices I, I, I've seen of the cultural roots uh, in the view of, yes, again, exchanges and exchanging experience, and we might find some, some inspiration points to, to work on. I try to, to group them according a bit to thematic. And uh, so we, we always with the, the perspective of how to say, uh, the, the challenge of finding the right balance between protecting, between promoting, between sustainability. I mean, many of the questions that uh, um, Professor Mats Rosmund was referring to at the beginning. So I, I hope I will touch upon some of these aspects. So let's start with this image that you see on the uh, top left. Uh, Straupe here. I don't know how many of you know Straupe. Um, actually, it's um, a very small town in uh, Latvia, and it's part of the, the Hanseatic cultural route. Uh, so Straupe was uh, located at the crossroad of uh, um, several trade routes, and in the uh, medieval time, it was a, a very important center. Then uh, it uh, underwent uh, uh, an underdevelopment, especially also because of the Swedish-Polish war <laughs> that was referred to also before. And like records say that just two inhabitants were left alive. So if this was the destruction that he brought in terms of human resources, even the, how to say, built architectural resources were very much affected. So we say a very small site and undergoing some uh, uh, decay what made um, what worked as a key strength for Straupe? So Straupe was small, but part of a larger network, part of a cooperation network. So the fact of being part of the ANSA made really the trick in the sense that in the last decades, the ANSA organized a whole branding action around it. And they found out through research that Straupe was the smallest Hanseatic town. And around this, they built a whole whole communication strategy. Um, and then they focus a lot on the local uniqueness and local products. So for instance, Straupe became also the first and the only uh, slow food earth market in the Baltic Sea. So this example shows how uh, small is not necessarily bad and how the trick there was in finding the unique element and in being part of a broader cooperation network. So this is one example. Then we can go to this other image uh, on the bottom of Straupe. And this refers to the Cluniac sites in Europe. It's another certified cultural route of the Council of Europe dedicated to the Cluniac uh, sites. We're talking about abbeys built uh, in, the, in the Middle Age. And Cluny is the most majestic one in, in France. What did they do? Mm, so several of these ar abbeys are still uh, in well shape, let's say, it's possible to visit them and they are uh, marvelous. Some other underwent uh, some uh, deterioration. And so what did they do? They built Clunipedia. It's an, an encyclopedia, both work online as a website as well as an app. They first mapped all the sites in, um, in Europe. We are talking about more than hundreds so that it's possible to always understand where is a given site and for a, a person to see and check this. And then they complemented this with photos to give a virtual uh, tour and also with um, 
virtual reality um, um, features. So when this uh, tool is used also on spot, and if I point my given tablet at a destination um, and direction where there was the, the wall of that abbey, and today is no longer there, I can have still uh, an impression, an aperçu, of how that looked like. So it's a way of bringing somehow an heritage which is no longer tangible, closer to the, the, the visitor. And you see here in the middle that they have also a specific edition of this uh, targeting children. Of course, the way uh, the message is addressed to different groups uh, uh, should, should be different. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, um, one example. Another example of using digital tools, I think also during this pandemic, we all witness a lot of the importance and the resource that having access to galleries um, mu of museums online, to having access to libraries of resources that would otherwise not be open and accessible has been beneficial also for our, yes, for our well-being, for our interest of knowledge. So this uh, image you see here, this uh, person with um, the smartphone, uh, it depicts uh, um, symbols. This is an app developed by the European Cemeteries route. Yes, we have also a cultural route dedicated to cemeteries. And uh, actually it, uh, mm, it provides with the opportunity to understand the different symbols in the uh, cemeteries. So um, um, cemeteries which are very famous, I quote just one like uh, Père Lachaise in, in Paris. Okay, we know who is buried there, there that famous artist, that famous writer, uh, painter, but uh, uh, even in the sculptures, the structure of the um, cemetery, we might not always get uh, uh, what's the symbol about. Yes, the angel is very common, but it's not the, the only one. So um, this app provides a way to understand these symbols and also the different interpretations in the different uh, countries. Another uh, example of good practice, this image where you see written Atrium Go. So that is the same uh, cultural route I mentioned at the very beginning about uh, totalitarian architecture. So totalitarian regimes of the 20th century Europe. Uh, what did they do? They worked with the high schools in the cities which have this uh, uh, heritage to develop uh, um, tourism uh, tours and also to uh, train tourist guides addressing the same target group of young people from high school age. So this was a way to bring somehow together uh, the offer and the, the demand in the sense of making this link between targeting young people who know best than them how <laughs> to, to be effective uh, in, uh, in this. Of course, this with, yes, the, the, the whole structure of people from, from the field with uh, um, architects, uh, as well as uh, with um, uh, ar artists, uh, as well as with uh, local authorities. So this is one uh, example, but uh, yes, when it comes to young people, uh, yes, I, I heard uh, very much with pleasure all, all the activities that you are already, already doing. Then other examples, this image with this lady who's um, working with a uh, doe. Uh, the, the topic here is uh, a strategic partnership and uh, taking on entrepreneurial uh, um, point of view. So um, the roots of the olive tree, and again, another certified cultural route of the Council of Europe, uh, developed a project called Well Olive. It's based uh, on uh, experiential uh, laboratories, and training to develop experiential tourism uh, packages and activities. Uh, and this is based on a very um, comprehensive uh, understanding of the heritage of the olive tree, which has a use in with culinary purposes, but also for wellness purposes. And it uh, brings with it a whole knowledge of uh, know-how and traditions on how to use these uh, um, land resources. So they made uh, these uh, um, um, experiential labs and they also along it uh, made uh, a blogger's trip. And this is still possible to be uh, visited on, online. So there uh, the cultural route got a benefit in terms of promotion, but also the local products and the local identity was very much more uh, promoted. Uh, another example of um, cooperation and partnership was developed by Via Francigena, 
it's a cultural route dedicated to um, the route that uh, an archbishop in Canterbury took to go to visit the Pope in Rome. So he wrote a diary and it's possible today to walk along this route. What did they do in Italy? It's very common to walk along, along it, it's very well known. They made a partnership with Train Italia, which is the national train line company. So who travels along the route can get a discount. So this is a way of somehow promoting an incentive to take uh, the train instead of the car and to get to know which are the different sites uh, which are uh, well, um, passed through by the, um, by the route. Uh, the same cultural route, the Via Francigena, you see the image with that big uh, cheese, uh, cheese piece on the top. Um, they made um, a whole, uh, they develop a whole tourism um, product called Stop and Taste. And so they work with local producers local farms, especially of Parmigiano Reggiano, because that is one of the uh, areas which is passed through to give uh, pilgrims, to um, give to tourists also the possibility to try and get to know about local foods. Again, also here, this proved to be a win-win uh, um, situation in the sense that uh, farmers and local producers got promoted via uh, the culture route and the culture route got promoted via the, the, the local uh, producers. Uh, and um, Via Francigena also made a partnership with local authorities in the Tuscany region, with the um, entity in charge of tourism uh, promotion. Uh, they made a whole branding study and research, but just to give an example of how this was successful, from 2011 to 2014, they uh, witnessed an increase of 30% of arrivals of tourists in the destination past by the Via Francigena, who had worked on this uh, promotion with tourism operators. So in, in four years, uh, a 30% increase was a quite uh, visible um, result. And I will uh, come now to the last two examples. I hope I'm on time, yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, so one example, here you see this kind of um, brochure where it's written 2019. Of course, you cannot read it, but I tell you what's about. Um, it was developed by the prehistoric rock art uh, trail. So you work on archaeology uh, and I can just imagine how hard uh, it must be to promote uh, a type of heritage which has his own very specific challenges, uh, <laughs> very different from what we were seeing before, like the rules of the Oli Tree or totalitarian architecture. So it's very different, peculiar from your field. Um, but here is an example that I think might, might work. Um, so what did they do? They organized these uh, events in different sites, part of the route in different countries, in the framework of the European Heritage Days. So a first element, they tried to uh, get a hold on a broader uh, scope. Then second point, what did they do? Uh, they organized like uh, lectures and storytelling session addressed to different uh, target groups from, from children uh, to um, young people and to adults in which uh, a person who's uh, capable of telling stories, uh, it's important, I mean, it's not always an issue, I think, of how much a, a, a topic in itself is interesting, how much a heritage in itself has value, but the way that stories told uh, makes a huge difference uh, in terms of attractive attractiveness and of understanding. So they developed this uh, session with storyteller and expert, academics, person who knew the uh, sites, the destinations, uh, and what they were doing. They were not only telling the story of the site, but also the story of the exca excavations. So uh, how can we, I mean, it's very challenging to bring somehow a prehistoric rock art close to us. I mean, we feel it very long, a uh, tiny time ago, definitely far from us. It's difficult to uh, somehow approach it to us. So telling the stories of the person behind the excavation was a good way of making somehow the link. Um, then the very last example, this image you see on the bottom uh, right corner, comes from Transromanica, which is the cultural route dedicated to uh, the Romanesque architecture. Again, it's a, um, a style of architecture of the medieval uh, times. Um, what were they thinking? They say, okay, there are still several 
and castles uh, in Europe, uh, which are still majestic uh, in, their, in their structure and they, they can attract tourists. This is not the issue, but what is lacking maybe is the understanding of how were these castles built, how much time did it take? So what did they do in Austria in cooperation with local authorities? They decided about starting building a castle according to the 20th century uh, methods. I know how. So uh, basically there is a construction site that you see and they are using just the material and working methods that date back to, to the time. So the people you see in the image, they're not uh, actors, people who do like a reenactment who yes, uh, try to, to, to take this role, but they are really carpenters, <laughs> blacksmiths, and it's possible to see how material is transported, how material is worked on. And this uh, uh, project was also serving with the objective of giving employment to local people, uh, like indeed blacksmiths, carpenters, who might have otherwise find it difficult. Uh, in the region to get uh, unemployment. So um, there are different strands which are uh, attained somehow in a parallel uh, way. And uh, that's an, a very ambitious plan. They think it will take about 30 years to build uh, the <laughs> this. But uh, I mean, um, so far it's working. They work and at the same time, it's possible of course to have a tourist guides and people come and visit. And it's a bit a link to what you were saying. If I understood it correctly, uh, I saw some of your pictures. You have excavation sites. Uh, some parts are already excavated. In other, you are conducted excavation also with uh, the participation of different groups. So this is a way of working together and making the discovery <laughs> at the same time and to render the idea of this dynamic process. So uh, I would finish here. I hope I give somehow some hints which are useful for discussion and I'm very happy to uh, answer your question.